Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Sometimes I believe it's good for us, knowing that truth, to just say, I love you, Lord. And I love you, Lord, and I thank you, Jesus. And have hearts of gratitude. Amen? If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter number 1 while we're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture this morning as we turn our thoughts to the idea of mercy. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3. Peter very simply writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He is telling us that through Jesus we have hope. Through the willingness of Jesus to be crucified, through the shedding of the blood of the sinless Savior, and through His resurrection from the dead, that today we have hope in the day in which we live, and the hope for any day that God gives us hereafter. Aren't you glad that there is hope by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the opportunity to stand and share these thoughts and pray, God, that you would bless us as we open our hearts to you again. Anoint me, use me, Lord. May we be obedient today in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a simple lesson in this verse. The mercy of our Lord is abundant. That is to say that it is plenteous. The mercy of our Lord is by no means in short supply today. And for that we ought to say amen. If you believe newspaper articles, there are many shortages that the United States of America is facing in this year of 2016. One report says that by 2025, America faces 90,000 doctor shortages in the days to come. So there's a shortage in doctors. There is also a shortage in nurses. According to the American Association of College of Nursing, enrollment is down. Graduation of nurses is down. The Food and Drug Administration is concerned because certain drugs that are used to cure certain illnesses are in short supply and demand is greater than supply. <laughs> the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is concerned about the amount of fresh water drinkable water in more than 36 states. They're concerned because there's a water shortage of drinkable water. There's a shortage of school teachers. They say it's because of the climbing student enrollment. There's more students being enrolled as the population grows. Also in many states there are new laws requiring smaller class sizes. There are more retiring teachers than teachers entering the profession in many areas around the United States. And so there's a concern that there's a shortage of school teachers. And those of us who enjoy and appreciate Second Amendment rights understand that there's a shortage of ammunition. Over the last eight years, it's been very difficult to buy 22 shells to go out and target practice. General Mills, this is going to shock some of you in a horrible way. General Mills says that there's going to be a shortage in some of their cereals 
because of climate changes where ingredients that make particular cereals are grown. You better stock up on your Cheerios, amen? There's a waffle shortage. <laughs> really? <laughs> that, uh, that little phrase, let go of my ego, hey, it's becoming more and more real because there's been production problems in two of their uh, production facilities which has actually caused a great shortfall in the amount of egos that have been produced over the last six months here in 2016. Purell hand sanitizer. They say there's a shortage because demand is increasing in a germaphobic society. But there's no shortage of the mercy of the Master our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says and that it is plenteous, according to Paul. Uh, it, there is an abundant mercy that is available to us uh, to give us hope. And we today need to realize that when it comes to our relationship with God as individuals and as a church, if we were to think about the one thing that we cannot live without at the top of the list of importance has to be mercy. Say that with me. Mercy. Mercy appears 274 times in the Blessed King James Bible. 216 times in the Old Testament. 58 times in the New Testament. The word mercies appears 44 times. Merciful appears 39 times, and yet throughout the scriptures, you find example after example of mercy being given to individuals, and we are commanded time after time to show mercy as Christian towards others. Amen? Now, it's impossible in the limited time that we have together this morning for us to do an exhaustive study of the topic of mercy, and so... This morning, we're just going to have a short examination of the topic, and hopefully it'll be profitable for us. Mercy is at the heart of the Christian faith, and therefore mercy ought to be in the hearts of Christians. Can I get an amen this morning? And Titus was a Gentile convert to Christianity under Paul's ministry, and Paul had left uh, Titus at Crete, um, the largest of the Greek islands to pastor a church that was founded there on a missionary trip. And so Paul is writing these words to Titus as they appear in Titus chapter number three. Paul writes, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit through his mercy, amen. Regeneration speaks of forgiveness. In other words, we are washed by the blood of Jesus. It is by the blood of Jesus shed on Calvary that our sins are washed away when we receive his mercy. Being renewed speaks of fellowship. It means it speaks of receiving the Holy Ghost when you are uh, uh, redeemed, when you are washed in the blood of Jesus, when your sins are forgiven, then you, are, you have a renewed fellowship with God that comes by way of the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life. If you believe that, say amen. If you don't believe that, then we need to study 101. God's presence in the Christian occurs when we ask, admit that we're a sinner, believe Christ dies for our sins, confess our sins unto Him, and ask Him to be our Savior. Amen. And His presence in our life is the guarantee by way of Holy Spirit that we are saved and that we are one of His. So regeneration speaks of forgiveness, being washed in the blood. Renewing speaks of fellowship uh, when we receive the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. Thank God all things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. And Paul continues in verse number 20. He says, now then, since we have been saved, since we have been washed in the blood of Jesus, since we have been renewed by God's Holy Spirit, he says, now then, we are ambassadors for God. We are ambassadors of meekness. We are ambassadors of compassion. Passion, we are ambassadors of mercy. Ambassador is a representative. And so we are to represent Christ by having these qualities or these characteristics present in our life each and every day. Again, Paul is writing Titus. He says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. The work of mercy is valuable, and we need constant reminders that we are to be more merciful than the mercy that is given uh, by the world's standards. Are you with me this morning? Amen. And Paul writes, our Savior gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us unto himself, a particular, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Amen. Peter writes in another place, Christ left us an example that we should follow his steps. Therefore, church, we are to be merciful as we have learned on Sunday evenings how important it is that our faith uh, uh, produce works that prove our faith. Amen. Uh, we are to be a working people uh, for a working Redeemer who now works in us and through us and He works on our behalf. We are to be an extension of the arm of God. Amen. That's why it's so important for us uh, to have the character that Christ expects us to, uh, to have and that is to have a character that shows that we have mercy, that we are willing to extend uh, even to those around us. Amen? Well, amen. I can remember that television show, Full House. How many of you remember that, Full House? That's still worth watching. Amen? That's still good stuff. Man, um, I always liked the character of Jesse. He liked to imitate Elvis, I think, a little bit. Y'all remember Uncle Jesse? And you know his favorite saying? What was it? Oh, mercy. But I'm not sure that he was using that in the way that we're trying to define mercy this morning. Amen. But first of all, we need to define mercy. We need to have uh, an understanding of what mercy really is. Uh, we often use the word mercy in our prayers. We pray for mercy in our hymns, in our songs of worship. We sing about mercy. And sometimes we do so without thinking about what we're really saying or what what we're really implying when we use the word mercy. A mother once asked Napoleon for a pardon for her son. And the emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense not once but twice and justice demanded death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son doesn't deserve mercy, Napoleon replied. True story as history records it. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask for. Well then, the emperor said, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son. We need to ask God for His mercy to be extended to us. We need to ask God that, His, that we be vessels of mercy and that, that we extend mercy to others. And the best way, again, to understand what something is, I think, is to understand what it is not. And so listen to me this morning, and I'll try to move very quickly. Mercy is not just referring to sentimental feelings because we all have sentimental feelings. Amen. 
Mercy is not just referring to sentimental feelings because sometimes if we stroll down memory lane, uh, that don't always motivate mercy within us. Because sometimes when we stroll down memory lane, uh, we remember a time when things weren't so good, and then we remember who it was that we blamed for our misfortunes, amen? And sometimes when I think about my past, the last thing that I want to do is show mercy to some of the people that I feel like have wronged me, and I'm the pastor. And if that happens in my life, it probably happens in yours. Amen. Amen. I mean, if I, I, some, there, I got people from my childhood, from my teenage years, i just like to punch them in the mouth right now. I would. Yes, I would. And, and I'm not so sure that if they were to show up, I wouldn't just punch them. Now, I hopefully would have mercy. It's just a good thing. I'm 1,200 miles from where I grew up, or I'd probably have more conflict than what I've got here in Missouri. Y'all say man. <laughs> well, I don't know if that was a good. Y'all don't understand. Well, listen, mercy is also not just helpful deeds. Amen. Let's just move on. Mercy is not is not just helpful deeds either, because some people equate mercy with kindness. If I'm kind to somebody, I'm showing them mercy. And while being kind to one another, it is a scriptural mandate. Once again, it does not express the true meaning of mercy. We are to be helpful and we are to help one another. And, and, and Jesus uh, clearly taught us that we ought to help one another. We ought to reach out to help one another. But helpful deeds is, is, is not just mercy. Mercy is certainly not justice. Justice obviously is getting what we deserved. I like that song that says, When justice called, mercy answered. Amen. I know that some of you have been caught red-handed in the act of a crime. But man, there's criminals among us. And you didn't hire a lawyer just to plead you guilty. I've never hired a lawyer. Ooh. <laughs> you don't hire a lawyer just to plead guilty. Just to say, yes, he pleads guilty. You hire a lawyer to bargain and then place you on the mercy of the court, whether it be the judge or the jury, amen? Mercy goes beyond emotionalism. Mercy is more than shedding tears, or some folks shed tears that are meaningless, amen? Some folks shed tears that are meaningless. Actors... Actresses do it all the time. I walked up to my boss yesterday. Excuse me. Friday. I didn't work yesterday. I just couldn't. Well, I went in for just about 15 minutes. Friday we had a meeting. Store meeting. Blah, blah, blah. So I walked up. My boss and, and another fellow and another fellow. And I walked up to him and I just got about this close to him. And I said, Mr. Oz, well, that's how I said it. Mr. Oz, when you get a chance, I want to talk to you face to face in private. And I turned around and walked off. And Oz, he looked and he said, I don't know when he's serious and when he's not. <laughs> and of course, I was laughing as I walked back up through there. We're pretty good actors sometimes. We're pretty good actresses sometimes. Sometimes we're pretty good at putting on a show. Uh, sometimes we're pretty good at putting on a show. But mercy is not just emotionalism. And mercy goes beyond humanitarianism. I need scores for these big points, hey man. Say that with me, humanitarianism. There you go. First Corinthians 13 and 3, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, but have not love, it profits me absolutely nothing. And how I wish that our church would continue to do what we're doing as we're trying to reach out in the community and, and help folks like the, the, the Christmas drive and the other things that we do and, and, and try to reach out and show 
the love, but mercy goes beyond humanitarianism. Mercy is distinctly different from forgiveness, too. Because God is merciful to us even when we don't sin. Now listen to me. Just as we can be merciful to those who never have done anything against us, so God is merciful to us even when we don't sin. Someone who says God's mercy doesn't just forgive our failures and our faults, but reaches deep into all our weaknesses and our needs. Amen. The word translated in mercy is a very passionate Greek word. It means to have mercy on, to secure, to assist the afflicted, to give help to the wretched, to rescue the miserable with a great sense of urgency and desire. So mercy can be defined as good's will toward the afflicted, joined with a desire to relieve them. And so obviously the opposite of mercy is hostility and aggressiveness that expresses itself in an unforgiving, fault-finding spirit. Well, let me say that again. The opposite of mercy is hostility and aggressiveness that expresses itself in an unforgiving and fault-finding spirit. Church, if there's anything that we need as Christians, most certainly it is to have mercy, the kind of mercy that the Bible says that we are to display. And all God's people said. So we need to second of all develop mercy. Paul says, Ephesians 2 and 4, God is rich in mercy. James 5 and 1 says God is full of mercy. And so we as Christians need to learn to develop mercy within our hearts. Be merciful, Jesus says, just as your Father in heaven is merciful. At the end of the story of the Good Samaritan, our Lord asks, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? In verse 37, he answered the question, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said, go and do likewise. In other words, mercy requires pursuit. And you remember the story how that the traveler fell among the thieves. And then there was two groups of people. And each passed by him and went as far away uh, as they could as they passed by him. As he was laying there hurting and humiliated. And finally one stopped and showed him mercy. And got him to a place where he could have help. And so Jesus says you go and do likewise. And so mercy requires pursuit. So we got to go after mercy. We got to bring mercy into our everyday living. How do you do that? Preacher, I'm going to tell you. You've got to prayerfully pursue mercy. In Romans 12 and 3, Paul teaches us that mercy, mercy is a spiritual gift from God. Therefore, it must be pursued through prayer. God, give us a merciful spirit. Lord, help us to display mercy. We've got to exam examine examples of mercy. You remember the story of Joseph and his brethren. And how his brethren, jealous of him, sold him into slavery. And years later, God had used Joseph basically to save the nation. And his brothers came before him, not recognizing who he was. And Joseph showed them mercy. Whereas if you know the story, some of us would have been tempted to not be so merciful to one that has sold us into slavery. David and Mephibosheth, I've preached that often. Christ has shown us mercy, yes. Many folks have shown mercy, but there are those that go beyond to be merciful. We need to examine the examples of mercy in Scripture and pattern ourselves. After them, we need to forge forgiveness. 
Say that with me. Forge forgiveness. If we're going to develop mercy in our lives, then we need to forge forgiveness. Exodus 34 and 7. Mercy associated with forgiveness. God says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and sins. I'm telling you, if you harbor hurt in our hearts, then we will be less likely to be merciful to those who have offended us. We need to force forgiveness. We need to learn to forgive and pray that God would develop forgiveness in our hearts because when we learn to forgive, we're more apt to be merciful. Third of all, we need to humble our hearts. The Bible says, what doth the Lord what doth? What does the Lord require of you? Well, He requires you to do justly, to be just, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God, to get close to God. We've got to humble our hearts. We've got to realize that while we did not deserve the mercy and the grace of God, He freely gave it to us, and we need to humble ourselves, and we need to show mercy to others. We need to be, can't, pay, man, I can't talk today. We need to be compelled by compassion. Develop mercy. Be compelled by compassion. Compassion and kindness walk step by step with mercy. You remember meekness produces compassion. Amen. When you're meek, you're more apt to be compassionate. And when you're compassionate, you're more apt to be merciful. Mercy is the step beyond compassion. Someone said... Acts of mercy that are void of an attitude of mercy are invalid. Mercy on our part must be driven by genuine compassion. And we must learn to love the seemingly unlovable. I realize there's probably not everybody in the county that not everybody's going to love me. Now, I'm going to preach sin is sin and I'm not backing down. All right, and while I love sinners, I'm not going to condone sin. Then when the government tells me that I can't condone sin from the pulpit, then we're going to be in trouble because they're going to handcuff me and take me out, and one of y'all are going to have to step up and say, I'm going with him, amen? Just hear me. I mean, we've got to stand for what's truth. Sin is sin, but we've got to have compassion for sinners. Amen. I don't have to point my finger at every person and say what you're doing is a sin. No. But if God so moves on my heart, then I need to, as Holy Spirit guides me, talk to them about how they can have a more profitable relationship with God. And sometimes that means turning from a lifestyle of corruption. We need to be compelled by compassion and mercy on our part must be driven by genuine compassion and we must learn to love the seemingly unlovable those who can't stand us. We gotta learn to love them. Those that ridicule us, we've we got we just gotta learn to love them. Amen. Well, I mean we do. The only way we can do that is to be governed by grace. Now listen. Mercy is also related to grace. You see, grace is what saves you. Mercy is what sustains you. Mercy eliminates the pain. Grace cures the disease. Mercy offers relief from punishment. Grace offers pardon from the crime. Paul wrote to Timothy, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Howbeit, because Christ came to save sinners, I obtained mercy. When those out there that don't know Christ are convicted by Holy Spirit, listen, and are compelled to receive grace and mercy and forgiveness, then they will begin to see things the way Holy Spirit uh, guides and directs them. Amen. Now stay with me. The problem in the world is obvious. It's sin. That's a problem. 
God's grace can cure that problem. Because the grace of God can pardon us from all sin. <coughs> and if God can pardon us from all the wickedness that we've done in the past, how can we not in turn pardon those who have sinned against us in one way or another? By showing them mercy. We need to be, go be governed by grace. And then if we're going to develop mercy, we need to realize its rewards. Proverbs 11 and 17. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. Living without mercy is a prelude to dying without mercy. In some ways, mercy is like a mirror. It reflects what you put into it. If you're unkind, then you'll find that life seems unkind to you. If you judge and criticize others, then you'll think that others are judging and criticizing you, and you'll see that. On the other hand, love produces love, and mercy produces mercy. Don't you agree, church, that we need to develop mercy? Shakespeare's question, How canst thou hope for mercy, rendering none? We've got to display mercy. Again, with shortages, I just read an article called Holiday Shortages in 2016. You're going to find this to be very disturbing. There's going to be a shortage of canned pumpkin. Really. Nestle Company, the largest canner of pumpkins in the United States of America, says that rain has ruined pumpkin, passage, pumpkin patches in several regions where they grow pumpkins and they don't have as many pumpkins to can so there could be a shortage in canned pumpkin because Nestle cans more pumpkins than any other pumpkin canner in America. Well, that was a tongue twister. Guess what? There might be a shortage in chicken wings. That disturbs preachers greatly. <laughs> I mean, holiday party favorite is a chicken wing. The production of chicken wings is down 3.5% in America. And that disturbs me. Honey. I like honey. Boy, I like honey on biscuits. Now, I'm telling you what, I don't do it a lot. But I'll have mercy. You give me some good honey, and that is a treat. I'll put honey in coffee. Oh. I don't put molasses in coffee. Molasses are strictly put your, put your butter, pour your molasses, do it like this right here, and spread it on a hot biscuit. Y'all know how to eat molasses. You know why there's a honey shortage? Beekeepers are concerned about pollen production because of too much rain in certain regions. Toys. There could be a shortage of certain toys. Because government regulations have forced the closing of some manufacturers. Now I won't get all political. There's a lot of folks that are losing their jobs because the government is requiring so much that they just can't meet it. Also, there's a prediction of shortages of letters to Santa through the U.S. Postal Services. I hope there's no shortage of goodwill among Christians this Christmas season. Amen? I mean, the true character of mercy is in giving. Giving help. Giving time. Giving money. Giving of yourself. Giving forgiveness. And in doing so, we display compassion. It's a simple servant. Luke 6 and 32 says, Give, and it shall be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. We need to display mercy. More often than not, when you give love, 
you receive love. Not always, but more often than not. You help someone, generally they'll remember that and they'll be eager to help you in the future in return. Not always, not always, but sometimes. Church, we must see our need for God's mercy. We must appeal for God's mercy. But we must also proclaim God's mercy to a world around us. Not reluctantly, but willingly. Nehemiah. What a great book in the Bible. Nehemiah was concerned because the walls around Jerusalem had fallen. And he felt like God had called him to do something about it. And if you know the story, God used him. He found favor in the eyes of a king that granted him certain things. Nehemiah went and he stood before the people. And this is what Nehemiah says. God is ready to pardon. God is gracious. And God is merciful. God is slow to anger. And God is a God of great kindness. And that passage of Scripture continues with Nehemiah reminding the people that during their direct obedience of God, their wandering in wickedness, their hardness of heart, their stubbornness of spirit, their aberration of activity, that, in the, that is their deviation and departure from the ways of God, their dishonor and digression in fulfilling His will. Through it all, Nehemiah, Nehemiah reminded them that God was merciful towards them. And still, the mercy of God gives way oftentimes to his judgment. 1 Samuel 15. You'll find at that time that God used the Amalekites to chasten Israel. And 1 Samuel 15 reveals the fact that there are times when judgment must not give way to mercy. Saul, in the battle with the Amalekites, spared their king Agog whom God expected him to slay. Samuel thought it not an act of mercy, but an act of disobedience. Hear me. The evidence of mercy was then found in the slaying of Agog later, so that his cruelty would no longer be a threat to a nation of people that God was protecting. Psalms 103 and 18, the mercy of the Lord is everlasting on those who fear Him, those who remember His commandments, remember His commandments and do them. I realize that leniency to criminals in regards to punishment is not mercy at all. It's actually cruelty to victims and potential victims. And I realize that there's not always a place for mercy. And judgment needs to be judgment. And justice needs to be justice. Crime does not always need to go unpunished. You hear me, church? God will still chasten you for sins you commit. You won't lose your salvation. But God will chasten you for sins that you commit. And we can't continue to break God's law and expect His mercy. And our nation is quickly becoming a merciless society. And at this moment in time, America deserves the wrath of God. Isaiah 54, 7 and 8. God is speaking through Isaiah. For a moment I have forsaken you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. God's being merciful to us as a nation right now. Imagine if you would a fork in the road. 
And to the right, the road is named Merciful Attitude. And it leads to happiness. And to the left, the road is named Cruelty Avenue. And it leads to misery. Church, we must come to terms with mercy. Define and understand it in our hearts. And we, among all, ought to know the importance of developing mercy inwardly in our hearts. And we, among all, ought to learn the importance of displaying it outwardly for the world to see. Yeah, there's a shortage of a lot of things in the world. But among Christians, there should never be a shortage of mercy. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Father in heaven, I pray that even at this moment there will be obedience in the house. I pray, Lord God, that as you speak to hearts that there would be a response Perhaps, Lord Jesus, there is one who would willingly acknowledge to you that they need to be more merciful to someone in their life. Lord, there may be one who would come today and pray that you be merciful to someone in their life. Lord, I believe that we all need to come and pray that we would see the importance of developing mercy and displaying it to the world around us. May we realize that we'll never do that until we fully surrender ourselves unto you in salvation and in stewardship. Help us today to realize the value of mercy as you've revealed it to us today. In Jesus' name, amen.